Good afternoon. I think everybody's in. It's nice not to be able to see anybody. I love these lights. We're here. This is this is the one that I wanted to come to most of anything because we watched all winter as Dennis walked us through the symphony, and uh, this is an opportunity to learn. This is uh, what your talk was about. It's about learning and sharing and conversation, and I think. You're about to see something that's going to be pretty special. So I'm just going to leave it there and let Dennis take it away. Thank you. Well, thank you, Gary, and welcome to everyone. I'm Dennis Mastromonaco, the music director of the Mississauga Symphony Orchestra. Certainly a pleasure to be here today. Uh, glad. Some of you have made it through some of this weather here. Hope it stays away. Um, I'll be your host, or I guess MC, as we go through this uh, talk this afternoon. Um, it's Think of it as a combination of uh, a bit of music and uh, some educational aspects to it, and also interactive. Uh, I always invite an audience to to ask questions. This, this isn't where you have to wait to the end <laughs> to ask questions. As we go through things, um, feel free to, to you know, interrupt and let us know what you're thinking um, as we learn about the violin. Uh, it's called Meet the Violin, and throughout the pandemic, as we were closed and only open to doing things virtually, I ran a weekly series called Meet the Orchestra, where people were able to learn and interact with our principal musicians uh, through the entire orchestra, everything from flute, through all the string instruments and the brass. And so today we, we of course, decided to do one on the violin, probably because it is one of the most ins important instruments of the orchestra. Uh, it carries a lot of weight, <laughs> as they nod to my right here. Uh, it carries a lot of the musical history of orchestral playing. Of course, joining me today on my right, is Corey Gemmel, who is concertmaster of the Mississauga Symphony Orchestra. Let's welcome Corey. Thank you. I believe you can read about him. Uh, I think some bios went out, but uh, Corey is not only a uh, concertmaster with me in Mississauga, but he is also concertmaster with Scarborough Philharmonic, uh, Orchestra Toronto, Esprit. Burlington. Berlin Philharmonic. Burlington. <laughs> Burlington <laughs> Symphony Orchestra. <laughs> Berlin. Uh, he's also <laughs> he's also a wonderful soloist and uh, performs with the ballet, the COC, uh, an incredible artist. Uh, so you're going to hear tidbits of playing, and of course, at the end, if you stick around, you're going to hear a wonderful um, piece of music. Also joining us is Jennifer Tung, our accompanist today. <laughs> and uh, you may have recognize Jennifer. She's been up here quite a bit and I believe was here last night with Toronto City Opera. Uh, so uh, we welcome her and thank her for being our accompanist today. Uh, so here's just a little taste because some of you maybe don't even know what a violin sounds like. First question is, what is that piece? Does anyone know? It's probably, well, if you sing it back, that, probably one of the most famous themes ever written. And it actually sits as number one of the most performed pieces by violin. And it is Spring by Vivaldi, just, of course, the opening movement. So you can hear the rest of it as uh, you go home and look up Spring. It's actually the whole series of concertos through the seasons. Um, written by Vivaldi back in 1720. So here we go through the history. Let's go back in time to there are historically two families of instruments of strings. One of them is in use today and the other is not. Uh, the first one is the viola da braccio. Braccio, by the way, means uh, arm. And it's also known as the violin family. Uh, the other is the viola da gamba. Gamba means legs, and it's a group of instruments that were played upright. Now, immediately you think, yeah, but we have instruments today that are played upright, like 
the cello, or the bass. Uh, these, both of these families, the violin family and the viol family, very similar names, which by, by the way, that, that name uh, comes from a Latin word that simply means stringed instrument. Um, so developing in northern Italy about the 1500s, they were existing at the same time. And the main difference between the group of instruments is the braccio family, the violin family, has four strings, and they're each tuned in fifths. So, for example, the violin is G, D, A, and E. And the other group of instruments has multiple strings, five, six strings. In fact, some of them has as much as eight strings. And they had frets, of course, played upright. Um, now, beyond that, the main differences of number of strings, one is tuned in fourths, one is tuned in fifths, is that they developed in two different paths. Now, explaining why the cello is played upright, and even the name, the violin was one instrument. What they did is they wanted bigger versions of it. So they took this and just made a bigger version, and it was called a violone, and it was just a really giant upright violin. And then they took that instrument, said we need an in-between instrument, and they shrunk violone, which by the way means really big violin, and they shrunk it and made a violoncello, and cello means small. So the violone, a really big instrument, and cello, a smaller instrument, simply means a small version of a big instrument. And they ended up with the cello, but they all derived from that instrument. Now I thought Corey can demonstrate we have a question right off. Yes. Uh, just one thinking of it. So when I watch fiddle music, yes. I see that. So is it just the way it's played between the violin and the fiddle? Yeah, same instrument. Fiddle. Corey, you, you could probably give us insight into <laughs> fiddling. Well, it is exactly the same thing. It's just the nature of the music that you're playing. That's yeah. really the only difference. Okay, that's what I thought. You can fiddle on a Strad. It sounds you... so different. That... Yes, it's just the player and the, and the music. Yeah, what was it, Isaac, uh, East Coast player? McIsaac. Mm -hmm. McIsaac, McIsaac, that for a while played on a Strad and played fiddle music on a million dollar instrument. Yeah. Um, what were all those strings that kept flying? Like, what, well, that's the hair on the bow. He oh, used to break, I yeah. See. Well, we're going to talk about the bow in just a minute. First, I want to get Corey to demonstrate really just the basis of the instrument, the four strings that are called open strings. So we have the open G, which is as low as the instrument can go. D a fifth higher, as Dennis said, we tune in fifths. A a fifth higher, and our highest string. And all the instruments, be it violin, cello, bass, etc., are based on, on these fifths. The only difference is viola and cello uh, start on a different note. They start on C. Um, but the bass, the big bass, actually uses the same instrument uh, notes, just a couple of octaves lower. Um, now, just speaking specifically about the violin, similar construction between violin and all stringed instruments. Um, and you could probably point at some of these, mm -hmm. these sort of ideas. Uh, so you have at the top, you have the scroll, and just below it, the tuning pegs, of course, the fingerboard. And there are no frets, unlike a guitar uh, or the other group of stringed instruments. There's no frets, so it's simply a flat fingerboard. So you can understand if there's any beginner violinists why it's so difficult to find their notes when they start to put their fingers down. Uh, you have the bridge, um, chin rest, which is, people always ask, what is that interesting thing? The chin rest, uh, F holes, which is my favorite. <laughs> we always joke at younger ages about the F hole. <laughs> Uh, what else is the fine-tuning uh, mechanism? That's just a tiny little peg there. Usually just on the E string. And ju yes, just on the E string. Tail piece. Tail piece. Yeah. Uh -huh. And cello has an end pin uh, that sits at the bottom that sits right on the ground. Um, so I thought maybe Corey can demonstrate uh, sort of the different things violins do because as opposed to most instruments that just play notes, it can do a lot of interesting things. First, the most two common things is the arco playing, which means arco is the bow, and that's playing on the string versus off the string. So 
So on the string, off the string, And what the bow bounces, literally bounces off the string, and um, sometimes called spiccato uh, or ricochet, depending on the type of music you're playing. Um, then there could be all these sort of interesting things like harmonics and double stops. Which sounds more like a flute or a piccolo. And harmonics are done very interesting by lightly placing your finger on two fingers, one on one string and just lightly placing it. Um, and that's what creates that flautando or flute-like sound. Yeah, actually we have two types. We have a natural harmonic where you, the string naturally does it at the eighth, the quarter, the three quarter, two thirds. And then as Dennis identified, there's another type, artificial harmonics, where you use a solid first finger and you cut a stop a perfect fourth away by touching the fourth finger. Or you can do a double stop. Two harmonics at once. Or you can play two notes at once. And end up playing more than one voice at the same time. And what everyone asks about the gliss. Oh, the gliss? Well, you want a slide? A slide. Where we slide around. Simply moving. And of course, are there any violinists? Here? We know that we oh. have one here Whoa. for sure. Do you play violin? Yeah. <laughs> a student of yours? No, no. we were just introduced. We were <laughs> just <laughs> introduced earlier. We just met. She's she's not a plant. I swear. Okay. We just, oh. we just met. Do you have your violin here? You can join us up here. Play some duets. I asked her to do that too. Oh. Um, and probably the last one that people always wonder around, around uh, ask around is about the pits. Oh yeah, plucking. So we actually can pluck in two different ways. You can. You take uh, your index finger on the other hand. Or. And you can pluck with your left hand at the same time. So that lands uh, under the category of very, very, very advanced playing. So don't worry, you don't have to learn that <laughs> for a little while longer. <laughs> um, Although some of these things seem very simple, even just doing harmonics, Corey makes it seem like a piece of cake. But in fact, um, all of these little tricks that he's doing are sort of the most challenging things you can imagine. Uh, we're gonna skip right to the bow, because um, we just briefly talked about it in bow construction. Um, there's different parts to it. Most importantly is the hair. The hair is always the thing that you mentioned flies off. And yes, um, the hair can get out of control. Uh, Corey, do you want to talk about your bows and <laughs> not that hair? Okay. Uh, the different bow constructions that you see here. So I actually have in this hand uh, what we call a transitional bow. It's not, it's not authentic. It's a modern recreation, but it's a bow that they would have used in the time of Mozart. And you notice, I'm running out of hands. It's actually very different than the other bow in my other hand. It's very straight, the other one is concave, and they're completely different lengths. If you measure the length of the hair. And they are even made out of different wood. Modern bows are made out of Pernambuco, and older, older bows would have been made out of a variety of different types. Pernambuco exclusively comes from the Brazilian rainforest. You know the place where they say is at the tipping point and no more? Yeah, that, there. So that's where that wood comes from, and that's what this is. Um, but by making the bows concave, unlike an earlier time, then you can, and lengthening the bow, you can play a lot stronger, much more robust sound, and you have access to the, to the variety of articulations, which we were demonstrating a few moments ago. Whereas the older bow, um, lovely sound though it may be, it just doesn't have the same kind of, it just doesn't have the same kind of tone at all. It's pretty but it just lacks the, the backbone that you would need to project in a modern large concert hall. And it's, you can bounce and stuff, but again, it just, it just lacks the projection and the power 
that the uh, middle class wanted in the uh, late 1800s, late 1700s, pardon me. <laughs> So it has a lot more, a lot more power to it. And the hair, Nels was referring to, it's, it's horse hair, usually from a stallion, and the best hair comes from cold climates. So places like uh, um, Argentina, Mongolia is the best hair, uh, northern Russia was Siberia. Yeah, places like that. That's usually the, the, the finest hair, where the hair grows very uniform, very thick, and then that's what we use. They get a little haircut and we bleach it and <laughs> toss it on here. <clears throat> and it does wear out. It's like brakes or car tires. It has a life, maybe depending on how much you play on my bows, at maybe three to four months, it gets cut off and replaced every three to four months. And you don't want to know what this haircut costs. Well, it's That's not too bad. The haircut itself, where I go, is about $70, which isn't too bad. And but your bow cost? They range between forty and $60,000 each. <clears throat> and your violin? The other one is, is about a quarter million, and this one is about thirty-five or 40000 Yeah. So it's having a house on your neck, isn't it? Yes, but prettier. <laughs> <It's the laughs> and it sounds better. Yes, so, so you can see sort of just the, an orchestra full of instruments why people put it on their shoulder and don't let it go. And they're like, would you like to take? No, no, they keep it with them. Um, Talking about bows and construction ties us into the first time period, and we're going to go back to the Baroque era. I won't go before that because that's middle medieval re Renaissance, and that's far enough back that the violin, sort of its popularity began during the Baroque time, which was approximately 1600 to 1750, so quite a while ago. Uh, this time saw the, shall we say, the early developments of the instrument. It's not what it is today. Uh, earlier bow, earlier uh, construction of violin. Um, composers at this time, you may recognize names like Bach, Handel from the German school, and from the Italian school, of course, Vivaldi, uh, Scarlatti, Tartini, um, and uh, although two different countries, music was quite similar. Violinists at the time, and you're wondering sort of who was famous as a violinist. In fact, most of these composers were violinists. Bach was. Uh, Vivaldi, Tartini, um, they were violinists as well as composers. Dual purpose back then, music was sort of still a limited field. Um, musical ensembles at the time, now this does all tie, tie into the violin, don't worry, uh, were quite small, except for Handel and some Bach, but generally Baroque music was very intimate. There was a lot of solo, uh, organ for example, harpsichord, uh, solo violin, um, and maybe small, small groups of instruments, um, trios, duets, quartets, uh, small, small, small. Chamber music was, although not called chamber music yet, was the way to go. And it was mainly church music. It was, for the most part, sacred. The one that branched off from that was Handel. Of course, going to London and England, where there was a lot of money support from the royal family, he was able to do very large works and that actually was really important for the development of this instrument because at that point he instead of having two violinists on staff to work with he had a body of apparently 180 violinists and that suddenly said oh I can write music for a lot of instruments and that propelled the art form in England uh, it took a while to get to actually Italy this is why Baroque music and classical music didn't develop in Italy as well. Um, musical styles besides church music, solos, cantadas, and then later oratorios. And musical style, Corey's gonna demonstrate a little bit of Baroque music. Bach? Bach is, or Bach is most famous for, of course, writing fugues, and that's part of a series. Um, which one is that? 
That's from his first sonata, with, and it's the fugue, the second movement from the first sonata. So if you're interested in Baroque music, look up Bach, Handel, or Vivaldi, any of the above, and uh, you get a good taste of Baroque music. After the Baroque era, we moved into the classical era. Now, we always say classical music, thinking it's all classical, but there was a specific time. And that existed from approximately 1750s to about the 1820s, maybe stretched to 1830s. Um, composers that you're familiar with from the classical era would be Haydn, Mozart, uh, a little bit later, Beethoven, and uh, perhaps Schubert, a little bit of Mendelssohn at the beginning of his career. Um, and um, uh, sometimes we throw in some sort of lesser-known composers, but I think you all know those, right? You've heard of Mozart. Have you heard of Haydn? Haydn? He's, he's, he's okay? He's a good one? Schubert? <laughs> The Unfinished, that's what we think of, and Beethoven. Beethoven, by the way, is my favorite composer. And uh, how many symphonies did Beethoven write? And you have to answer this if you're under the age of 15 in the audience. How many symphonies did Beethoven write? Nine. Nine. You told her, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh, summer, a few weeks before school. And my challenge to those under 15 is to listen to all nine symphonies between now and the end of the summer. And you may think, why? Um, my challenge to you is to sit and listen to it. Now you could be playing Xbox while you do it. But um, the wonderful thing is that as you listen to it, one thing will happen is you'll actually go, I recognize that. You, you'll come across something and go, what? I've heard of that. Of course, some of the symphonies are used in commercials, background music for tons of cartoons. And anything you grew up watching, you've heard Beethoven. I guarantee there's three symphonies in there that are extremely popular. The fifth, the seventh, and the ninth. And then the sixth, if you ever watch Bugs Bunny, it's full of Beethoven six. Maybe not the first two symphonies. So have a listen to all of them, and you'll recognize some Beethoven. Uh, famous violinists, in fact, Mozart, Haydn played violin. This is where you start to hear some popular names like Stamitz and Kreutzer. And um, the ensembles, a very important time where the growth of the orchestra began, classical music, the establishment of an actual orchestra. All the strings and the winds and the brass and percussion are starting to become a true ensemble. Until then, it was small groups, right? Chamber music. So the establishment of the orchestra was really important for the classical period. Musical genres, three important things developed the string quartet and the composer most famous for that is Haydn the father of the string quartet solo works meaning a single instrument with accompaniment and the symphony an actual symphony baroque music didn't really have a lot of symphonies so when you hear the word a symphony well that's really uh, um, became stable in the classical time period now can't demonstrate all of those, but I thought a classical piece. I think this is Mozart, right? Yes. Um, of course, incredible composer of the classical period. Very famous for all of these things, solo works, symphonic works. Although I'd say Haydn would be more popular for his string quartets, but uh, Mozart, incredible artist. Again, if you haven't listened to much Mozart, he wrote 41 symphonies. I would only listen to the last three. The rest, eh. Uh, <laughs> and he has some wonderful operas. So here's a bit of Mozart. That was from his third concerto. This is the first movement. Yes. Yes. Um, haven't, I haven't conducted that one in a long time, but... It's but a charmer. It, it's really, really cute. Third concerto, there are five. Um, have a listen to all five. Mm -hmm. Just went blank there for a moment. <laughs> five. Sometimes they say there's more, but there's really only five. Listen to the five of them. They're all beautiful. Um, any questions so far about Baroque, classical music, anything? Yes. Yes. Uh, we had a band from, we started really quite young up to grade eight. And there weren't any of the 
zones. And with the prices you're just saying, is that why there weren't any strings? No. Um, okay. uh, uh, it's same with Winston Brass, for example. Um, uh, a noble can run, a professional noble can run between eight and 28,000. But a student trumpet, you can get it at, um, Costco sells them for $129. Uh, actually, they sell violins too for, I think, $149 or something. And a vat of maple syrup. Alone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's quite amazing. And so not to, to um, push people away from music because they think, oh, it's so expensive, lessons and everything. And this is something, I, I'm on a tangent now, but the importance of, of the arts in general, that we always think that it's for the elite. It's for the wealthy. It's for you know, incredibly bright people or anything like that or snobby people. Um, I came from a blue collar family. My father was a mechanic. My mother was a farmer. Um, I don't know about their backgrounds, um, but most musicians come from fairly humble backgrounds. And affordability. Um, uh, you could put your child in, for example, soccer, as mine is, and it's six to $8,000 a year. Whereas you, I can buy an instrument and have a year of lessons for you know a thousand, couple of thousand dollars. So it's in fact not costly at all, um, but we all think it is. So investigate the arts, get them into violin lessons and piano, um, and at the very least expose the next generation to the arts, being visual arts, uh, dramatic arts, or of course musical arts. Uh, so after the classical period, we enter a time where the oh there was another question yes you mean the fine tuner dear that's a great question so when we use the pegs the pegs change a lot right so the fine tuners on your violin it's a lot easier to use them isn't it but when you get older and you kind of get used to it and your hand gets a little bit bigger um, the pegs are actually much faster to tune the exception though is the E string it's so tight if I use the peg and I turn it even a little bit more than where it is now, they simply snap. So we leave one fine tuner for the E string so we can turn the fine tuner a lot and it just barely changes the pitch and it keeps the string really safe. That's why. Sure, you can put as many on as you like. But there is a, an issue, especially if you get into more higher end instruments, the more metal and the more material you put here, it starts to deaden the sound. So you want to keep this suspended weight at the back as light as possible. What takes everything on the violin affects the sound from the heat, the humidity, if you look at it the wrong way, if you, <laughs> if you open the case in the wrong order, we tend to be a little OCD. Um, but it really does change quite a bit. So adding more weight from fine tuners. But for students, of course, you know, little fingers, it's, they're trying to learn and adjust their ears. So it makes perfect sense they have something that where the, uh, the expediency of being able to do something safely and learn from it is more important than a you know a one percent change in the sound. Did you want to demonstrate what snapping a string looks like? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. There have been situations, uh, in fact, that I've been in where violinists will snap a string. Sometimes in the section, the worst is when it's a soloist and they swap the instrument with the concertmaster, which is unspoken sort of tradition that they. <laughs> have to give over an instrument missing a string uh, and have to play the rest of the concert trying to figure out alternates for why that string isn't there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the Romantic, as we call the period after the Classical Era, is uh, the Romantic period. It ran approximately 1820s, a little bit earlier if you consider Beethoven and Schubert Mendelssohn starting it earlier, all the way to about the turn of the century, approximately 1900s. Some composers we know that wrote romantic music into the early 1900s, like Mahler and Sibelius, uh, Rachmaninoff in included. Uh, but of course, giving you sort of just guideline years here. Some of those composers, as you know, come in sort of the, the ones that continued the symphonic tradition of Beethoven. Uh, so that would be someone like Schumann or Brahms. And then you have the, the nationalist school, the ones that, were, that involved a lot of folk music, like Dvorak. And then you have the Russian school that were uh, Tchaikovsky and Rimsky-Korsakov and, of course, Mussorgsky. Uh, so different avenues of composers, very different than the classical period or even the Baroque, that it was basically uniform. It didn't matter what country you came from. The music was music. Classical music 
sounded the same everywhere you went. Uh, when we get into those 1800s, where you came from affected the music. If you were Spanish, your music actually sounded Spanish. If you're Russian, it sounded Russian. And that was the nationalist schools that started to propel that style of music forward. Violinists during this time started to become famous for being violinists, not composers. And this is where we have people like Paganini and Sarasate, of course, Seitz and uh, Josef Suk, you're probably not familiar with that name. And the Strauss family, if you've heard of the Waltz family, they were all violinists because they actually led from being a violinist. Um, ensembles during this time is where the orchestra, as we know it, became the standard. A classical time period, like I said, it developed, but it was in the 1800s where it became what you went to see if you went to see a symphonic concert. It was an orchestra. Um, musical genres. The symphony was, of course, popular, left over from the classical world, and something called programmatic music. And this is music that had a theme. So it wasn't just called symphony number no. seven. It had a title, for example, uh, something Scheherazade. It's based on the 1001 Arabian Nights. Or uh, an opera that was just about a story. Or Tchaikovsky's Romeo, Romeo and Juliet, Hamlet. So they were based on books, stories, or folk tales. Uh, Dvorak's Czech Suite is a series of folk tales put to music. And that was a really important development in the history of music. Now, in terms of violin, the Romantic era was unique because there was now a division between solo music and orchestral music. If you listen to a piece of classical music, and you only listen to the violin part, you would recognize it. Uh, for example, can you throw out Ein Klein? You just... Sure, I decline it. Yeah. So you recognize this? And it, if Corey played the whole thing, you can literally follow the entire melody beginning to end. That started to change during the romantic time period where solo music, the soloist plays always the theme, etc., versus orchestral music where the instrument, the violin, is now one member of a large puzzle in the orchestra. And we're going to give you two examples of this, of what, let's say, a solo concerto sounds like um, versus an orchestral piece. So this is a bit of Brahms' okay. violin concerto. Um, Brahms, of course, a huge orchestral composer. He wrote one gorgeous violin concerto. one of the hardest openings for any concerto. Very challenging piece that has a lot of notes. And you can just listen to the part, you're satisfied. Solo music. Orchestral music was very different for the violin. Now you are a member of a team. You never truly play the melody beginning to end. You need to hear the whole orchestra for that. So I thought, why doesn't Corey play a piece of music, but only his part? You're not going to hear the whole orchestra, just his part. See if you recognize what the piece is. Be before you go on, you know what that is, right? Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. And that's the only part you usually know. And of course, there's more of it. But just the violin part.
Yeah. <laughs> so very different than Baroque classical music where they can play all of it and always carry the theme. That started to change turn of the late classical into the romantic period where they, they have to be part of a group. And that was a really important step to separate orchestral music from the soloist and the importance of violinist in an orchestra. So voicing or orchestration is what developed from that and why orchestras have lots of string section. By the way, in an orchestra, there's the first violin, the second violin section, and then viola, cello, bass, and all the winds and brass. Into our final topic, and it'll help tie all of this in, into perspective, and that is the role of the concert master. This name comes up often. The concert master is the first violin that sits immediately to the left of the conductor. The role of the concert master changed over time. Uh, going way back to the Baroque era um, and early classical, the concert master would be standing in front of the group, leading, physically playing something and leading. Uh, Corey's really good at that. They don't need me as a conductor because <laughs> he leads from his chair. Um, and during that time, they would play and sort of conduct. The development of the conductor didn't happen yet. The conductor was, was a non portion of music. Uh, so the importance of concert master or the leader was to literally lead the ensemble. Of course, keep in mind, you remember the Baroque era, the groups were small. So it was sort of easier to lead. Classical era, they started to grow. And it was at that point in the late, you know, uh, 1700s into the 1800s that they started to need someone else up there because his part was no longer the melody, as you just heard. Right? He plays a bit and then stops, uh, whereas before, for example, the Four Seasons, start and end, he can play the whole thing and everyone knows exactly where he is and just follow him. It's like, play a long recording. Um, but that changed, and so then a conductor was needed. Now, that's not the only role of a concert master. Is your question? Oh, <laughs> I was like, the mosquitoes. <laughs> I felt them on my back biting me, but I didn't want to. <clears throat> uh, so as the concert master developed throughout the 1800s and into the 20th century, um, you may say, well, do they still lead? Yes, in fact, leading the string section. Uh, the principals lead their own section, but it is truly the concert master, Corey's role in an orchestra, to lead their section. But in fact, the whole orchestra, many musicians are trained to just watch the concert master, because some conductors aren't very good. Um, <laughs> Dennis is incredibly easy to follow. <laughs> well, thank you, Corey. And so just before we, we hear some violin playing, conducting. This is something that I throw into every, everything, because you may say, what does a conductor do? So I, if you can all just take your right hand, whatever, if you have something in your hand, um, take your right hand and just place it. bounce. That's beat one. And then you're going to come back down, but go to your left, that way. <laughs> that's beat two. And then when you're going to come all the way across to your right again, that's the third beat. And then back up is four. So you're going to bounce, left, right, up, bounce, left, right, up, bounce, left, right, up, and Down, left, right. Good, now you're all conductors. <laughs> so, <laughs> you've all graduated. Uh, so that, by the way, when you go watch a concert, you think, wow, I want to be a conductor. I'll just, they wave their arms in the orchestra place. Um, what you see is the 0.1%, uh, in fact, musicians. What you see in a final presentation is like an iceberg. What you're witnessing is the tip. And then there is this enormous iceberg underneath that you don't see that is the work, the, the years of school and triple master's degrees and 20 years of study preparing for the tip of the iceberg. So if you want to be a conductor, let me know. 
can have my job in a few years. Question. Yes, you're a conductor. Yes. What do you, so they all play instruments? And how many, or, or what, what is their? Uh, so different uh, training systems. Um, most conductors at some point played an instrument. Some still do. Um, I myself gave it up. Um, I, I can speak of myself when I studied in, in Europe, um, uh, in particular in Vienna, uh, the conducting teacher and the system there did not allow us to play an instrument. In fact, we were told, if you want to play an instrument, go be an instrumentalist, but you're dedicating yourself to being a conductor. Um, my Gianluigi Gelmetti, my teacher in Italy, uh, once yelled at us, of course, we were sitting it's Italy, it's summer, it's beautiful, you have a bottle of wine. I was sitting on the Piazza del Campo in Siena and uh, me and a couple of musician friends and the teacher happened to be walking through the town square, right? And there you can drink on the street. <laughs> and uh, he looked at him, uh, he says, oh, ragazzi, uh, gentlemen, you're, you're, you're enjoying your day. And he says, yes, yes, you know, it's nice night. And he said, let me remind you, the day has 24 hours in it. Uh, two of those are for eating, six of those are, f uh, two are for eating, yes, six are for sleeping, and the other 16 are for studying your scores. Of course, the next morning, we we're a little hungover, and he tore into us in class um, for not studying and drinking wine instead. Uh, but that's the philosophy there. Here, it's quite different. Here, you are an instrumentalist. You don't really learn conducting until you're late into university, into your master's. And some play piano, some are violinists, uh, some are winds and brass players. It's all completely different. Uh, we all learn all the instruments at a minimal level, and some never learn them at all. Um, you don't want to hear me play violin. It's, <laughs> I'll kill a cat. Um, but yeah. So the concert master, the last step of the concert master is that not only do they lead from their chair, they also have to play the solos. And this is something that was unique in the late 1800s, is that the composers would say, well, the old leader is now sitting there. We might as well make use of it. So they wrote these really incredible elaborate solos in their music, where the orchestra stops, and it's, here you go. And here's an example of one. Is this the Rimsky-Korsakov? Mm -hmm. Russian composer wrote Scheherazade, the story of the 1001 Arabian Nights. And this is the violin solo or cadenza in the middle of the piece. Thank you, Corey. So I've covered all the most important topics historically from the introduction of the violin through all the time periods, all the way up to modern concert master roles. Are there any questions? Yes. So it, it depends, it's a, a, you're very observant, it really depends on what we're playing. So if you think about it, anybody ever gone snowshoeing, deep snow before climate change, yeah. 
So imagine that you, I mean, the whole idea is that you're on the snowshoe and it, dis it distributes your weight more evenly so you don't sink in, right? So that would be if we had a very flat hair. It's kind of on the surface. But if you cut the, and you can hear it's not quite catching so easily. If you cut some of the snowshoe off, you'll sink in a little bit more. And that's playing a little bit more on the edge. So if you want it to articulate, and you can hear it sort of sounds like little consonants ta -ta 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 -ta, doing that, which is definitely what you want in an example like that where we have the, we want those little flutters and articulation, so it makes sense to change that. But it would depend. If you're playing something insanely strong and loud, not, not unlike what we're going to be doing later, um, then you'll sink more arm weight in. You're probably going to use a flatter hair just so you have more resources able to grab the string and make it vibrate. The more the string vibrates, the more the violin resonates and produces more sound. And, and the uh, resonating well, you'd probably have to talk to a violin maker on that one. And in fact, I, to be honest with you, I mean, even though I, I play the instruments, what little, I mean, as players, we have to have at least a working knowledge of the instruments because they're, they're really high maintenance. You know, this is actually a brand new instrument. It's only 16 years old, which is why I'm using it instead of my other one because the weather is just messing up the other one horribly. Um, and newer instruments tend to be more stable. Uh, but nonetheless, the slightest little thing, if the bridge moves, the, nothing is glued, by the way. Nothing on the instrument is glued at all, except for the, the actual uh, box and the ribs. Nothing else, everything else is just held in place by sheer force. So if the bridge moves a millimeter, if the sound post, there's a piece of wood, looks like dowling connecting the top and the back. If it moves even like a fraction of a millimeter, the voice can suddenly change an awful lot depending on whatever is going on. So we have to be very careful. You don't bump, you don't bang. The needs of the instrument, they, it, it's a very capricious, ever-changing sort of environment for the instrument. My pleasure. Any other questions? Either for, yes. Well, so there is no standard size. When we call it full size, what you're really getting is just a shop's approximation of what the instrument of a size that might be appropriate for a kid versus somebody who's more adult. Um, I can take this out. If I can, I'm gonna need three arms. I'm here all week, honey. <laughs> so this is my other instrument, and it's it's Italian, and it's it's considered full size. But if you look at the two of them back to back or side to side, they're very different sizes. Yeah. So this one's obviously a lot smaller. And a cons. Sorry. Two hundred and fifty-ish. But yeah, and now I mean it all depends. The sound is very different. Now how much of it's going to come through in here because it's uh, suffering, I don't know, heat exhaustion or something. It's a very different sound. You know, there's a depth and a sweetness on that one that just isn't quite present in the other instrument. So it, it all depends. So you ask, is, does the size make a difference? Yeah, absolutely. But you know, Stradivarius, he made roughly a thousand violins, give or take a few, and no two were the same. He started with a brand new mold every single time he made the instrument. So he never hit a moment where he's like, ha, got the secret sauce, put up the golden arches, let's get this done, franchise the thing. It never happened. Every single instrument was an experiment. So, and, and they still experiment to, these day, to this day. So, uh, as I said, this is, and this one isn't that old. This is from 1904, 1907, pardon me. So 1907, and the other one is from 2005. Historically, it's not a big difference, but they sound completely dissimilar. So I'm not sure what to say about that. I'm sure violin makers themselves, for all the fancy theories, they'll find something that works for them, I suppose, and I'm, and I'm sure they have different ideas about the, the, the size of the instrument and the proportions and how it affects everything. But there's a lot more, if I can put it this way, there's probably as much or more magic in how it gets created. There's more art and how it gets created and what it sounds like than science. They keep trying to use scientific 
methods to narrow down why the instruments work the way they do, but the more they do, it, the more it just sort of highlights the mystery that still surrounds it. That and the bow. I mean, the bows are as much a complication of the sound as anything else. So it's, uh, it's one of the joyous parts of what we do. Another question at the back. Stradivarius? I love Sibelius. So he's a wonderful Finnish composer, by the my second favorite composer, Stradivarius. Yes, every Strad sounds different. Some of them sound magnificent. Some of them, frankly, aren't worth the time of day. But, uh, yeah, well, I mean, it sounds like a silly thing to say, but, you know, again, they're works of art. Some of them have been played out. You know, the, you consider if an instrument has been in continuous heavy use. I mean, look at today. It's, it's you know, this, this really does wreak havoc on it. It's one day in its life. You do that for 350 or 400 years, you know, they're cut apart constantly and put back together again. It's like having plastic surgery every couple of years where it's completely ripped out and, and its guts ripped out and new heart put in, new lungs and transplanted. There's only so much the instruments can take. So, you know, the instruments, they come and go. Some sound better, some sound worse. Depends on how they've been handled. A lot of variables in that. Another question. Like like the Casino Rama gig where <laughs> you didn't have to play. <laughs> no, this, that this was Hamilton. That was Hamilton. Oh, Hamilton. This this is a this this one always cracks me up because I've done that where I've been waving my arms conducting, and well, you tell the story. So I, I have played with some unusual people, uh, as as you were just mentioning. I've I've worked with uh, Hugh Jackman, you know, Wolverine. Um, Olivia Newton-John, uh, you, you just meet these people, right? There's nothing particularly unusual. Some of them are really magnificent. Loved Hugh Jackman, by the way. Uh, but the gig Dennis is referring to, right before lockdown, in fact, was the, the, the musical Hamilton. So I was contracted as concertmaster for it, and I never played one note. Um, they, had their own, they had their own touring concertmaster, and just the way things worked out, they had to have a Canadian concertmaster I was supposed to play and somebody's nose got bent out of shape. So for the run of Hamilton w until March the 13th, I think it was that Saturday. Friday, uh, Friday was the 13th. So Friday, uh, there was the 14th, I got the call. I was technically the concert master and I never played the show. I just had to show up and uh, it sounds ideal, but actually it was quite annoying. I had to show up and uh, sit there and then go home. So that was the unusual one. But I have played with people like Elton John, et cetera, you know, uh, Smokey Robinson, uh, the guy from Super Champ, I can't remember his name. I don't know, different, uh, different, different people come what along the, through the years. The, the Millie Vanilli style concert, as I call them. Um, I thought that was a Rama one. Oh, the, uh, uh, the Canadian tenors? The Canadian tenors. Josh Groban, that's right. Well, the Canadian tenors one, I mean, some of them, it depends on who they are. So some of the artists are fantastic. Like Hugh Jackman really can sing. Actually, he sings, puts a lot of professional singers really to shame he's fantastic and he's a nice guy um, which is extremely rare and I actually met um, Carrie Fisher at one of his shows backstage which was kind of cool um, everybody loved the guy he, sorry loves the guy he's, he's terrific um, but yeah there was uh, so some of them are fantastic uh, Smokey Robinson I mean he must be in his 80s or 90s last time I played for him he still nails it right out of the park so some of these people are magnificent but Canadian tenors everything is faked it's all done <laughs> Even what we play is all faked. It's just there's a, a sound system, and we rehearse, but all we're doing is just playing along to whatever you hear. It's just all fake. Every once in a while, they choose one number where they try to sing because they're just singing to the track, and then it doesn't usually go so well, and then they go back to singing <laughs> the other stuff. And there was a funny one with Josh Groban once when we were playing, I think it was at the Labatt Center in London, and he was, he was stepping down some stairs. And, and I, it, sometimes it's so good you can't even tell. It didn't occur to me he wasn't singing. And um, all of a sudden, he stumbled, and he stopped. You could see his maybe so inches from me. He had a small fall, and he recovered. But in the meantime, of course, the song's still going on. He was still singing magnificently. I was like, oh, OK, I get it. The whole thing, because it's so loud when you're in the middle of that. Or Andrea Bocelli. I played for Andrea Bocelli. And they do the whole thing. I mean, he can sing. He just can't do it in time. But he can sing. And he was uh, playing piano at one point, except he's not playing piano. It's all fake. So he was like nowhere near any of the correct keys and they have the camera angle so you can't see and it's all 
it's all dubbed in and just made to look like uh, somebody knows what they're doing. And yeah, it, it's quite interesting because the orchestra rehearses, they're hired, uh, paid very well. These gigs tend to pay very well, even as conductors. And uh, you, you're there and you're, you're doing this. And they have the microphones all set up, but they're, they're not on. They're playing a recording. And what you're listening to is a recording. Which, by the way, as professional musicians, it's very, very annoying. Um, because we're like, we sound better than that recording. There's a live energy that is there. Unfortunately, the people on tour uh, that you go hear sometimes, uh, maybe they're not ready or they're tired and they can't put out what you heard or they just can't sing. Um, all, all these sort of issues. But So some fascinating, that was a good question, by the way. <laughs> Not necessarily, but I mean, they're, 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 the risk is that, you know, these shows cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to put on, right? right. So they, they don't want to risk their investment. Mm -hmm. So they don't want to put that in jeopardy. So unless yeah. that artist has like a rock solid, like 100% it's going to go, they'd rather hedge their bets. They don't want the audience leaving feeling that this was an inferior yeah. product. So we did one with Michael Bolton uh, about five, six years ago. Uh, he was coming to Mississauga and... Um, uh, right a couple of days before the show, I had to sit down with, with uh, one of their music directors and manager, and it was, do you want to track it? Or, which by the way, I was the only one with an earpiece, so I can hear the music going through my head in, in my ear. Uh, do you want live or recorded? And I said, I want all live, because the orchestra's good, they can do it. And so we, we went back and forth, and there was only one song that they said, Let's let's do the recording. It it it, it ended up being a mess because it was Nessun Dorma, <laughs> and they played the recording because he couldn't time it with the orchestra. They said, they said don't 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 try to do it live with Michael, but the rest was live, and I had to ha really argue and say we can do it live. And they were like, oh, should we risk it? Should we not? Uh, because there's no he doesn't do a sound check. Keep in mind the big guys they don't do sound checks. They send someone else. Someone else does the ch sound check. I met Michael at seven minutes before the concert with a glass of wine in his head. <laughs> and then you're on stage, right? You've never worked together. Uh, so they don't want to risk it a lot of times. But that, that was so what's. So how can it be called live then? Just because the person's up there and they're. Mm -hmm. Because it's a show. But it's a yeah. show. It's not necessarily about the music, right? You're there to see the production. Yes. Uh, we get, I get so particular that our music, I don't want amplified. If you come watch the Mississauga Symphony Orchestra, we are not amplified. And the rare occasion where we do it, like when we're in a pit and you're watching an opera and people think we're amplified, we are not. I will fight and say, get that mic out of here. Uh, and you see mics hanging in the air, but those are just for recording purposes, not for amplification. And that's the great thing about live music, true orchestral music. Any other questions before you're going to listen to sort of the solo feature? You're going to hear a wonderful piece. Anything else? Because then I get to get out of the way. I'm going to turn it over. Uh, Corey and Jen are going to do the Chrysler. Yes, Is it the Prelude? Preludium and Allegro. Great piece. I'm just going to turn it over and get out of their way.
that's it. I'd like to quickly thank all of you for joining us and hope uh, some of it was educational and informative. And uh, uh, if you do have any more questions, um, I'll, I'll be around a couple of minutes if you'd like to ask. Um, special thanks to Corey and Jen for being here. And a thank you to Gary and Gail for inviting us and uh, allowing, allowing us to share uh, some of our musical arts for us. Thank you, Gary, Gail.